everyone. Ah, I did the earlier service and I, I have the same feeling that comes over me um, when I see us all together. Uh, I don't think there's anyone here who takes just our actually being here for granted anymore, do we? And um, I have to say, I think we are all taking stock. It's not over yet. I'm going to share that with you. Uh, we're still going through so much. Um, but I have to tell you, it, it's just an honor. It has been an honor to serve on behalf of 11.7 million patients. Um, I Early on in the pandemic, I'll tell you a story if you remember. Uh, I was approached by Ryan Vessler. He is the owner of Homage, the t-shirt company, and he wanted to do a t-shirt. He told me uh, and my husband that I was trending, <laughs> which was completely lost on me. I, apparently, I, to this day, have 50-some thousand Twitter followers, and I have never once tweeted. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he had this idea for a Dr. Amy t-shirt, and what I said to him then, and this was March of 2020, was that you're going to know me for a couple of weeks, I thought. <laughs> and, um, but before this is over, there are going to be so many heroes. This is going to be like a relay race, and the baton is going to get passed from person to person. And that's when he came up with the, what became a meme for us, not all heroes wear capes. Um, and those t-shirts went everywhere. They went <laughs> around the country and the world and raised all this money for youth homelessness, something near and dear to my heart. Um, but that really is the truth. I was the tip of the iceberg. I had this amazing governor to stand by. I had, you know, a thousand and some employees, 113 local health departments, and everything you saw us go through, good and bad, ultimately was experienced by every one of us. Um, every school teacher, every administrator, every business owner, it just, all of us went through it, nurses who had to be afraid to walk to their cars at night because they were being harassed. And, and so we've all gone through something together, quite a trauma really, um, from which we're still learning how to emerge. So I'd like to share some of that with you, the backstory of the pandemic, how it led to this new work that I am doing, um, and really what my hope is for us moving forward. Um, I am, I can't say enough, a very ordinary person um, who just found herself in the crosshairs of history in a very weird moment. Um, I am in awe standing here speaking. I do not love public speaking. <laughs> I was horrified. I consoled myself often saying, it's the Ohio News Network at 2 p.m. Nobody's gonna watch this, right? <laughs> and, um, but as we know, um, truth would have it, I was actually supposed to be trained by the CDC and all the spin and all the people who run each state department. And the week before I was going to be trained, um, I tripped over our dog gate. <laughs> well, we have a little old dog who has a lot of little issues. And um, I broke my pelvis. It was actually the fall of uh, 2019. I was on a little walker. And um, so I missed the training. And that was one of many blessings when I look back now. There are just so many amazing serendipities and things that happened, but I didn't learn how to spin. So I only knew how to talk the way I'm talking to you now, which is as a, a mom or a doctor would, which includes often having to say things that are really hard, which is coming alongside you. So, you know, and to the governor's credit, I was never scripted. I teased that I was the Ted Lasso of politics. <laughs> I truly was like, hey, State House, let's go help Ohioans. And they're all, <laughs> you're not one of us, are you? <laughs> and, um, and, and, but they, they never once scripted me. Honestly, the words would come to me at four in the morning when I would get up early before my calls started at six, and I would jot them on a card. When I said, I'm not afraid, I'm determined, it was something my husband said to me as I was walking out the door that day that we were doing the stay-at-home order. There were just so many things that came to me on and on, I could tell you. And when they have looked and studied at what we did in Ohio, the New York Times actually did an op-ed. They looked at seven weeks of our press conferences and they analyzed it and said that we communicated differently. And they're studying that now. Um, and the things they said we did, first of all, we owned it. Um, and then they said that we were brutally honest, 
vulnerable, and that we empowered people. And that formula I've really, really come to see. I didn't do it intentionally. I'd like to take credit for that. But that's what happened when we came together. Brutal honesty was so important. At the time, you know, I ended up in the White House the last week of February as the stock market crashed the second time. Um, people were starting to pay attention, but I was craving truth. At one point, I Googled the word pandemic, even though I taught global health for many years at OSU, because I'm like, why are we not naming this? For me, brutal honesty, um, it came from my childhood. You know, I have a lot of hope, but hope is optimism with a plan. And when you don't put the table, like put the cards on the table, we can't solve the problems we face. So I have a love and I had a faith in Ohioans that if we just told them where it stood, that they would be motivated to act, and they did. The next thing was vulnerability. It was just trying to acknowledge the truth of what we were all feeling. Um, it's also a part of courage, but courage does not mean you don't have fear. Courage comes from the word heart, which is just open-hearted. And surely this plague and this pandemic broke open our hearts in so many ways. And we talked about that. And lastly was empowerment. We asked you to do something. Every day we had asked something little or big, help a neighbor, help the nurse, watch her children while she has to work that double shift. And I want to tell you this. There was no order that could flatten the curve in Ohio. It took the actions of all Ohioans, and they did it in droves. They did it. They pulled one another up on a life raft. That's, that's the magic of what happened in this state. So taking those things forward, the other thing that got said about those press conferences is that we created a ritualized holding space. And we all showed up. I mean, how rare is that, that we stop everything and in time we came there. And in the end, the governor, we were sequestered. Even the press were no longer in the room. And all there was was the three of us and a cameraman and this one lens, a dark lens, but on the other side of it was all of us. And that was the most amazing feeling, and you could feel it. And just like after 9-11, when everything fell away and there were four days where there wasn't a stranger on the street, I would say here we felt about six weeks of that. Now, you have to realize that we were at war and we were at war with a common enemy. When I was in the White House that last week of February, I literally said to Mick Mulvaney, the President's Chief of Staff, that this was our higher angels moment. This was that FDR, Lincoln Churchill moment. When I would teach global health, I used to say if aliens invaded from outer space, we would finally recognize we were all on the same team. And that is what we had. We had the worst science fiction nemesis that I could imagine. It was an invisible enemy. It was asymptomatic spread, like every day we learned something that just made it worse. It didn't kill most people, like MERS did, which dies off then and doesn't spread. It was just the perfect virus. And if it was like Ghostbusters and we could throw some green dye on it, and we had little green blobs going around, we would all be like, oh my gosh, we know what we're fighting. But it was invisible. And like so many things that the pandemic unmasked, the situations that were already here, um, they lay there invisible. We don't see them. Um, George W. Bush read John Barry's book, The Great Influenza, and I've gotten to know John Barry quite well. He's writing another book now. But he realized that the gravest security risk to this country, put the virus aside, was a pandemic, either man-made or biologic. It's not just the virus that hurts us, but it is the fear, the intolerance for ambiguity. It's as contagious as a virus. It disrupts supply chains. It disrupted every aspect of our lives. And in that, bad actors take advantage of that disruption. So they knew even then, they knew what was all coming toward us. Um, it is a zoonotic disease. And there's this concept that really stood with me. It's called One Health. One Health means that animal, human, health, and the environment are all one ecosystem. And there's nothing like a pandemic like this to prove that fact. But that term, One Health, is a G7 summit word 
that is used, whole countries are trying to get their arms around our ecology right now and our planet. And that was actually, that term came from um, Dr. Lonnie King. He was the head of our vet school here at Ohio State for many, many years. Um, but that is the concept. And I started to think about that oneness. Um, we often would say things, I had many spiritual illusions during the pandemic. I talked about Viktor Frankl, I talked about Joseph Campbell, who studied all world mythologies and religions, looking for how we live a life well lived. And he really, really talked that we're on these heroes' adventures, we all go off into dark force. There are times when all of us can't look the other way, we have to meet some sort of nemesis. And if you're lucky enough and you slay that dragon, you return to your society with the gold and the beauty. But right in the middle of those heroic adventures are always gold, and we came across them. First of all, so much has been made about the vitriol and the hate. And it was real, and I don't want to make light of it. Um, the people that were in our yard were the same people at January 6th, and they were called to be there. Um, you know, there were Jewish tropes. People probably didn't notice, I'm Jewish, my husband is Episcopal, that while they were outside our little house in a very ordinary neighborhood, that my Christmas decorations were still up <laughs> because I'd been so busy, I couldn't take them down. Um, but for me, you know, religion has always been around this concept of oneness. And in Jewish religion, the most, most sacred prayer is the Shema. It goes like Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And that verse is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God and the Lord is one. And I have to tell you, with all the vitriol and hate, rooms as large as this sanctuary, which are our mail rooms, the governor's and mine, filled up with things Ohioans were making and sending to show their solidarity. I need to tell you that the love was so much greater than the hate. I remember artists like Bonnie Bowen, she was 90 years old, and she started to do a watercolor every day of the pandemic. Day one, day two, day 300 and whatever we were getting to, 90 some years old. And then at some point she got COVID and she was met with 250,000 plus prayer messages sent her way by Ohioans and others around the country. So you can't tell me that that little act of kindness, that way of our connecting, didn't save her life back, but she was saving our lives with her whimsical drawings. I said six degrees of Kevin Bacon spread, and pretty soon there was a Bacon statue six foot high in a corporate park in Cincinnati. I talked about Colbert's show and how he had Michael Stipe, the singer from R.E.M., on who sang this haunting song that I shared with Ohioans, that there was no time for love like now. And I shared that song, and next thing I knew, Michael Stipe called to talk about the unity work he is doing all over our country and our world. There was a mom who started to make signs that said, act on love, not hate, playing on my last name, act on, which I would have never thought of. And so we started to say to Ohioans, act on love, not hate, Act on kindness, not fear. Because as we know, fear was contagious and remains contagious. I want to tell you that these disruptions, I see them everywhere I go. We all know that nothing is working quite normal yet. Banks are not working like normal. Institutions, places of worship, we've all been enduring so much. So kindness, nature, and connection, I'd like to talk about those as the antidotes for you. So the other thing from the pandemic is that in the midst of all the chaos, and I learned this in my childhood, which was pretty rough, right in the middle of every disaster, if you look and linger long enough, is the pearl of the next great opportunity. And I would teach my teams to look for it. In the pandemic, we did things, we moved mountains you could never move in ordinary life. And we discovered things. We discovered, for instance, nature again. We went outside, we got outdoors, and we hadn't done that in so long, as I was saying in the children's service. We experienced the anthropause in our, our silencing. I remember driving through all the traffic to the state house, knowing that in two weeks we would look like the streets of Wuhan. And as that traffic settled, 
pollution started to clear, and songs from birds changed, and the nature just started to try to heal itself and heal us. It was an amazing thing to witness. But we've also known that we do have diseases of despair on the rise. We are seeing the gun violence, the mental health issues, racial and environmental justice movements are afoot. We are facing right here in our region unprecedented growth. We know that we're gonna grow by over a million people. Climate change, we're watching that and feeling overwhelmed. Um, we know about heat maps now and our temperature rising and how we need to plant trees. And of course, we are dealing with the polarization that we face. Nietzsche said that suffering is essential for the soul. And uh, many believe that we are sitting in the midst of the fourth founding of our democracy, that the beginning of our country, Reconstruction, the Civil War, and this moment have a lot in common. And we go through developmental changes as societies as much as we do as people. But suffering is making our soul, our hearts open. I see it everywhere I go. Vivek Murchi, he is our Surgeon General, he wrote a whole book on this called Together, and it's the healing power of a connection in a sometimes lonely world. And he says that almost all of our pandemics, and I believe this too in public health, are related to our disconnection and our loneliness. So we have our work cut out for us. I've actually come to believe, again, that nature, connection, and kindness are the antidotes for our time. So lo and behold, one day after I had stepped down, someone shared with me a book. It's called Rapid Five. It's Rivers and Parks Imaginative Design. It came about during the lonely days of the pandemic, actually. Um, and it was written, um, it started with Keith Myers, a very quiet and unsung hero who actually talked John Wolfe into removing the dams out of our rivers that we would not flood that we could actually reclaim our green spaces. And I can tell you, and you can go to our website and look at this book, it's the, in it, all its beauty. When I saw this, I thought, who is thinking this bold? I literally cannot unsee this vision that five design firms and all of our cities and jurisdictions, Urban Land Institute, our Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, they had a vision for how we can grow and put nature at the sun of our lives. Mr. Myers is like Frederick Law Olmsted, and I became fascinated by Olmsted. What he realized that halfway through New York City's growth was when he had his vision for Central Park. And can you imagine if he had not claimed that space? Well, we are in our Central Park moment. And if we do not do this, I can't live here anymore because it is so amazing and eminently doable. Now it turns out Frederick Law Olmsted was not a landscape architect to begin with. He was a gentleman farmer. He was a writer about slavery in the South. And Lincoln tapped him to run the Sanitation Bureau, which ultimately became the American Red Cross. So he understood public health and the social determinants and the fact that only five years of our 30 years increased life expectancy was due to everything I learned in med school. The other 25 years come from things we can only solve together. Clean water, safe food, the child labor laws, so many things that we have to solve together. The actual community conditions that surround us are what give us a chance to flourish. And we've gained this life expectancy, but we can also lose it. And just like the silent victory of the pandemic when we flattened the curve in Ohio, when we win in public health, you don't see the victory. That's the job, we're preventing it, right? And so many times we forget we become complacent when we don't fear that our child will catch polio out on the playground, mothers lined up to give that shot, we forget. And so it is this complacency we battle so hidden in plain sight, we have five rivers that we turned our backs on during development. They became basically drainage ditches. We don't have mountains, we don't have oceans, but hidden in plain sight are these gems. It turns out that we have 145 miles of waterways. 
in their tributaries. 80% are in the public domain. When these founders looked at the Atlanta Beltline, at the High Line in New York, the Houston Bayous, and other cities around the world, people could not believe the assets we have here. So they invented this vision of connecting our blue spaces and our green spaces, and they had five major pillars. It was about health and well-being, economic development. We cannot attract the workers we would love to have to come take the new jobs we have unless we have things for young people to go do, to build trails, to get out in nature. But it's also about creating businesses all along these waterways that open up to the natural environment. And there are small minority businesses, businesses that are coffee shops and, and places for portage where you could rent something. It's a whole new economic development engine. You can't have economic development without human development. We'll never achieve our greatest wishes for prosperity we don't also have vitality. This plan has ways to preserve the natural splendor of these waterways. It also has mobility solutions that connect them all. And finally, it's inclusive, because these waterways perfectly divide our community and are in every neighborhood. So literally, it puts within every resident nature within a mile of everyone. It also had these amazing plans for culture and arts layered over it. I learned that Alum Creek was the liquid pathway to freedom for slaves because people would travel along the sycamores that would glow in the moonlight. They came up with ideas for outdoor classrooms. And when I saw this, there was literally a plan to reconnect Hanford Village to the, to the waterway of Alum Creek undoing redlining. I've talked about redlining forever and ever. How our zip code affects our health more than our genetic code. And this plan literally reconnected neighborhoods that were split by, this, by, by the freeway. I, I, I was in awe. And so, of course, I don't remember saying yes to the job. <laughs> but imagine, if you would, that we leave a legacy for the children to come, that we don't miss this moment in our community's history that we do put nature and connecting us to one another at the center of how we grow, it is entirely within our reach. And that we, once again, learn about healing and hope through nature, what we discovered in this pandemic. There's so much more you can read about it, but I have to say, this is the North Star going forward. You know, tycoon alam is a very cherished Jewish principle. It's about repairing the world. So I want to leave you with a couple more things to think about in terms of that. Um, ordinary life is when the most extraordinary things happen. You know, as we think about our city and the great things that we will do, it won't be another sports team or another thing that will save us. It will be our quality of life. What it actually feels like to live every day here, that we could just vibrate a little bit differently. Um, at the heart of our healing, we are going to have to mourn all we have lost, and we're not done. I'm telling you, I watch institutions and people, we regress in times like this, and I know all of you feel it. There are days it is enough for me to get out of bed and just do what I can, and I go to bed that night, and I hope my husband forgives me. Um, and there are other days that we just can't look the other way and we do have the energy to reach out and keep pulling one another back on this life raft. This is a very, very important time. We will have to memorialize this. We will, we will mourn it, but we will move forward. So our isolation begets the need for kindness and mercy and grace. Kindness is not, again, niceness. Niceness is saying things to each other and then going behind one another's back and kind of, you know, it's superficial. Kindness is an age-old enduring principle from every world religion. It is about the God in me greeting the God in you and seeing our common humanity. It is so, so essential to how we move forward right now, and it is so hard to keep that in our hearts. It is proven to have huge effects on our health and well-being. And so I ask that we all try to move forward in this next phase with that kind of spirit of mercy and grace. I saw what Ohioans did for one another. 
I got to witness the incredible power, and I see it, see it every day in what people do. Uh, may we please remember that we're still in it, and we just need to hold on that little bit longer and share that mercy and grace one, with one another. Um, so this is my hope. Uh, my hope is while we see all that a plague reveals, so many of these issues, so many of our disparities, so much of the suffering was there all along, but now we're awake for it. I said that we are not shutting down, we are opening up. So my hope is that we learn the lessons of one world, one health, and my one hope, my one hope, and I, I know we will realize it, is that we are gonna emerge from this, not only whole, but with so much more in our hearts than we ever had before. And my blessing is that may our lives, this is a Jewish blessing, may your life be for a blessing. Thank you so much, and I look forward to walking this path with you. Be well.